Um, I'm still doing that first. I'll do that first prayer, and then I'll switch off with April and for the song. No, I. I got the initial start. That's in five. just a second. So, no, I don't know where Michelle is. Wow. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Now, let's all stand and prepare our hearts to worship the Lord. God, we just thank you and we praise you for who you are. But we just thank you. Praise you, Lord, that you came for us. Now uh, that um, we didn't work our way to you, Lord, but you came and made a clear path right to you. Uh, that we'd be reunited with you in relationship, Lord, that nothing stands against us. It's all been paid for by the cross, Lord, and we thank you for that. We thank you, Lord, that, um, that the cross is sufficient for every single sin, Lord. Uh, that you covered us and made us righteous in your blood. Lord, so we come to praise you this morning, God, to give you our best. Lord, we say thank you. We love you, Lord, and we're here to worship you this morning as a body, as a congregation, Lord. And all God's people said,
crossroads, everybody. Uh, we have some announcements that on your handout when you came in. We're going to start on the flip side today. Uh, just some, uh, we have some new coffee house hours that we're trying out on a trial basis there. We have some information there. Check that out. Uh, like I said, it's something we're trying out. It's our goal to help minister to as many people as we possibly can to share the love of Jesus with them and with our community. So check that out. We have all the information on the back of your hand out there. But just below that, you'll see that tonight, if you can believe it, tonight is Trump Retreat. So it's coming tonight. So if you signed up for that, first off, for everyone who has signed up, who has invited people, who has donated candy, who has prayed for us, and everything else, thank you so much. So we have had such a great response for, for this event tonight, and it's just, I'm so excited to see how God's going to use it. So thank you again so much for everyone who's participating. If you have signed up to be here tonight, uh, 4 o'clock, if you could be here by 4, that would be fantastic. And it's 5 to 7 tonight, so please come on out, bring your kids, your grandkids, other people's kids, whoever. Um, we'd love to have them here. So, but that is tonight, 5 to 7. And then, well, also, I want to make sure I don't forget this one. After the service, if you are a veteran and you serve in our armed forces, we're doing a special picture up here on the stage after service. So after church, if that's you, hold back a second, come on up. We'd love to get you in the pictures for Veterans Day, um, which is coming up soon as well. So please uh, just a note about that. So then walk through Bethlehem. Uh, if you're not familiar, Walk Through Bethlehem is our annual Christmas outreach that we do. Uh, and it is so exciting. Things are really moving for that. If you haven't had a chance yet to see all the construction that's been going on back there, it looks amazing. Um, we had another great crew out here on Saturday. We had over 30 people out here putting up those walls. And it's just, it's looking amazing. I know. I know. And it's just, it's so humbling to see how many people are. Yes, let's give them a hand. That's a great hand. So it's a real blessing to see how well it's been going up. And so um, if you haven't got a chance, go check it out. It's looking great. Um, so and if you have been involved with, it, with that, we are going to do another work day on Saturday. So same kind of setup time-wise. We'll be sending out some notifications about that. Just be aware of that. Um, and so it also, before I forget to say this too, if you signed up to act, even if you haven't heard back yet, you're in. So, all right? You're in. You're in. So come on. Um, we love, so we're going to send out a rehearsal schedule this week. Keep an eye out on your email for that. If you don't get it, feel free to reach out to us. Um, we try to make sure we got everything, but clerical mistakes happen. We do pretty good, though. Um, but if you're wondering about that, feel free to send us an email at the office or give us a call. But if you sign up to act, we got you. Come out for the first rehearsal. We'll have everything you need there. And so, but again, thank you for the great response for that. But if you're the kind of person who says, I want to be involved in walking back around, but there is, there is no way I am going to act. There is no way I am doing that. There is a whole lot of stuff that happens in Walking Bethlehem behind the scenes that does not involve acting that is still vitally important to make Walking Bethlehem happen. And that's what we have on our sign-up sheet today. We have a lot of different roles here that is just, um, that make Walking Bethlehem happen that you don't always see. And so that's what both sides of your handout are. We have a lot of them are self-explanatory, you know, clean up afterwards. You gotta make sure everything's clean. Uh, we also have passing out cookies at the end. Uh, we have child care and nursery. Those are for people who are working in Walker Bethlehem, not for people coming through it. They bring their kids with them. So it's just the kids whose parents are serving. Uh, parking team, help make sure people, you know, the very first face they see. Uh, the prayer team, a lot of people don't know this, but we have, every night for Walker Bethlehem, we have people praying over all the groups as they come through. Praying for God to work in their lives. Praying for God to use work for, to use walk through Bethlehem to touch their hearts. And so we have a prayer team. We have costumes. It's getting them distributed. Any kind of mending or fixes that needs to be done. But even if you don't know how to sew, making sure they get checked in and checked out and all that, all that aspect of it. We have a new thing right below that called logistics. Um, and that one is uh, it's the, move, the moving things. So that's making sure the groups get moving through on time. 
you know, and don't get backed up and making sure that stays on schedule. That's making sure if you've been through walk through Bethlehem before, you remember they get the shekels to the tax collector at the front gate. Those shekels have to get back over for the next group. And so making sure that we have people running those back and forth and making sure that, you know, the pens where they fill out the cards and they get from the auditorium back to registration to get to the next people. All those little things that need to move around, that is that team. So especially if you like to get your steps in, that's a great place for you. Um, <laughs> We have our tech team, all the tech that goes into Walk Through Bethlehem, our ushers helping people find seats here in the auditorium, or registration as they come in. If you don't want to act, but you want to be in costume, we need extras as well. Help fill out the city, make it look like, you know, make it look full. Make it look like an actual city with just people all over the place. Uh, on the back there, we have staging and decorating that's putting out all the props, the tables, the benches, setting up the shops, everything that goes into that. Uh, the what's next table, a lot of people might not realize this either, but after walking through Bethlehem, we have hundreds of people turn their life over to Christ and raise their hand and say, hey, I accepted Jesus into my heart. And we have a table right after that the banner that says, what's next? And they can go there and we can help them make sure that they get connected at the church, this church. And, um, you know, we can help them get connected here and grow in their relationship with Jesus. And so we need people there. Uh, we need people at the end of tour talking to them, you know, making it a... Lovely experience from beginning to end. Uh, security, serving the worker meals, and then if you're just willing to serve anywhere, we have a spot for that too. Since um, so please, you know, pray about this and you know, fill it out, drop in one of the offering boxes. We would love to have you as a part of what God is doing and walking up for us. So if it's your first time with us also, I know it's a lot of announcements. We got one more thing. If it's your first time with us, we are so glad that you're here. Uh, and if you haven't already, please make sure you stop off at our welcome center. We have a bag, it's full of goodies, it's our way of saying thank you for visiting with us. And if you already got your bag, after church, please come up here to the front or go to our reception room through those double doors down here on the bottom level to your left. We'd love to get to meet you, put a face with a name, get to know who you are. And church, aren't you so excited to have our guests with us today? <laughs> All right, we've been sitting long enough, so why don't we stand up, find someone around you and tell them you're happy to see them this morning. Thank you. 
for saving us, for calling us, and for loving us, Lord. Thank you for everything that you have done in your goodness, Lord. We are so grateful, and we are here to praise your name this morning, Lord. We love you with everything that we have, and all God's people said, Amen. You guys may be seated, and please turn your attention to the video. Italy. 
of all places, where he comes into contact with Paul. So the cultural background is this, in case you're not familiar, during this Roman period, slavery was embedded in the culture of the Roman Empire. It was common, and it wasn't a racial issue. It was an issue of person's status, whether it's financial or social. So essentially, slaves did seek to try to run away, to get away from that position of being enslaved to someone else. And if a runaway slave was caught, there was usually a price for them to pay. You might say, what was the price they had to pay? It wasn't anything financial, but it was more physical. If a slave were run away, when a slave got caught, once they got caught and they were brought back to their master, the price that they had to pay was brandy, and they would be branded on their forehead. In addition to that, they were severely beaten. In some cases, they were castrated and even executed. Many things would happen to that runaway slave. And slave owners, they were pressured if that runaway slave was caught and brought back to their slave owners, the slave owners were pressured not to show any grace or, or mercy or make any exceptions whatsoever. So now we have Paul, who's writing this letter to Philemon, a slave owner, about his runaway slave Onesimus, who has been caught and being sent back. And again, Philemon, if he's going to follow the advice of the Apostle Paul that we're going to read here, if he follows the advice, he's going to run the risk of being considered a traitor and going against the grain. Because Philemon was Onesimus' master. In your notes, it says this on your handout. It says the whole premise of Paul's letter to Philemon and to us today is this. If we're going to make things right in a world that's gone wrong, it requires us to follow Christ, who is who? Our master. Our master, wholeheartedly, but also to love other believers as brothers and sisters in Christ. So in this book of the Bible of only 25 verses, the first three verses are an introduction. They're a greeting. So this book or this letter or this postcard, whatever you want to call it, if I live in, could be structured this way. First, we have the praise of Philemon in verses 4 through 7, where Paul mentions specific characteristics that stand out in Philemon's life that should stand out in every believer's life. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And then next week, verses 8 through 16, is the plea for Onesimus. Paul is pleading with Onesimus. Now that he has had a conversation with him in Rome, for him to go back home and return and reconcile with his master. And then lastly, we have the promise of Paul. That will be the third message in this series I'm going to share with you. And that's in verses 17 through 22. And basically, what this is going to teach us is that Paul is going to tell Philemon that, hey, this is the advice that I've given Onesimus. And I'm encouraging him to follow the advice. But if for some reason things fall through the cracks, Paul says, I promise that I'm going to make things right. So that's still yet to come. <laughs> but for today, just to get to know this man Philemon a little bit better, look with me in Philemon chapter 1. And let's look at the first three verses that Paul is writing. Paul identifies himself. Paul a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother. So Timothy apparently is with Paul in prison. To Philemon, and our, our beloved fellow laborer, and to beloved Athia, and to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the house that is in your house, in Philemon's house. So Philemon was a believer in Jesus, and he started a church in his home. He would welcome people into his house Sunday after Sunday and probably would do what we do here. They would probably sing praises to the Lord. They would worship him. They would study the scriptures. Athia is mentioned here as well, which we believe is his wife and Archippus, his son. And Paul, again, is writing this letter along with Timothy, greeting the whole family. 
But then we have a little bit later, we're introduced to someone else, and his name is Onesimus. We'll read about him starting in verse 10. But again, Onesimus is in Rome, where he ran away to, and he's with Paul. He's a runaway. Paul's in Rome as a prisoner. Somehow, we don't know how, the Bible doesn't tell us, but somehow, Paul and Onesimus come together. And they have a conversation with each other about Onesimus' situation about his situation, but they also have a conversation about Onesimus' salvation. And Onesimus gets saved. You wouldn't expect anything less from the Apostle Paul, right? Because the Apostle Paul is the guy that wrote Romans 1.16, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believes. So in this myth, he's listening to Paul, he trusts Jesus Christ as his Savior. And this amounts into this story here that will unfold for us as one of the greatest examples in our Bible of redemption as well as reconciliation. And it's recorded right here for us. But we have a situation. And here's the situation. You still have a Christian person. His name is Philemon. He's been stolen from. He's been abandoned. So what would Paul tell him in the letter that he's writing to him? And more importantly, how would Philemon react? Would Onesimus, would he, Onesimus, return home? Or would he be terrified to do so, knowing what normally happens to runaway slaves when they're caught and brought back to their master? The branding. The beating, the possible execution. Can you imagine Paul's conversation with Onesimus? Right after Onesimus prays and he receives Christ as his Savior and acknowledges his forgiveness of his sins, including stealing from Philemon. Can you imagine his conversation? Paul probably told Onesimus this. He said, Onesimus, you need to go back home, and you need to make things right with the man that you stole from. And Anisimus probably responded this way. You want me to go back? <laughs> you know what they can do to me, right? You understand that, right? You know what they can do to me. Paul, you need to go back. Let me tell you something, Nisimus. I know your master, Philemon. I also led him to Jesus. And this is what I'm going to do. I'm not going to send you back empty-handed. Before you go, I'm going to write Philemon a letter. And I want you to take this letter that I'm writing, and I want you to give it to him when you, when you arrive home. And that letter... That's the letter that we have today in our Bible, the letter to Philemon. And that's the letter Onesimus took back with him. Now, as scared as he must have been, Onesimus took that letter, leaving Rome, went back to Colossae, which is in modern-day Turkey. And can you imagine what took place next? He travels to 2,000 miles back from Rome, Italy, to Colossae, and he arrives back home. He walks through the gate. He walks up to the house, and he starts to knock on the door. Somebody, who knows, I wasn't there, but somebody obviously answered the door. Whether it was another servant, whether it was Philemon, whether it was Philemon's wife, whether it was Philemon's son, Archippus, answered the door, and when, it doesn't matter who answered the door, when they opened the door, when they saw Onesimus, they must have been shocked. Are you crazy? <laughs> What are you doing back here? And he's probably shaking in his shoes. But in his hand, 
He has that letter. And back in that day, it would be like a scroll rolled up. And they are shocked to see him, and he just extends out. His hands are probably shaking like crazy. He extends out that letter. They receive it, and they give it to Philemon. And Philemon takes that scroll. He unrobes it, and he starts reading. And he reads that greeting, that initial greeting from Paul. And then he reads about the praise of himself, of Philemon. And that's where we are in verse number four. Would you look at it with me? Philemon chapter one, verse four. Paul writes to Philemon and says, I thank my God always mentioning you in my prayers. Whenever I hear of your love and faith that you have shown toward the Lord Jesus, and for all the saints, that the sharing of your faith might be most effective by the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you. From who? Christ Jesus. Paul writes, For we have great joy and encouragement on account of your love, because the hearts of the saints, the believers, are refreshed through you, brother. What a bunch of great compliments that he made. And I know when you were reading this, you were probably thinking Paul is just buttering him up <laughs> to get him to do what he wants him to do. But I'm not so sure that's the case. I sense that Paul is really thankful for Philemon's ministry, and he wanted to tell him that. You see, sometimes this is a great example for us today. Those of us, not necessarily that are in full-time ministry like myself or, or Cody or, or Bill, but for anybody that's serving the Lord in some aspect as a volunteer even. Because sometimes for us, we, we serve and we see the value of our ministry. We see how important our ministry is. And we forget that it takes all the members of the body of Christ ministering together for the body to function the way it's supposed to. Efficiently and effectively. Amen? Amen? For instance, can you imagine me up here this morning and I'm preaching to you, but can you imagine me also leading our kids' ministry? Can you imagine me leading our youth ministry? You're supposed to say no. <laughs> Thankfully, we have Brother Angel, Miss Kayla up there. Can you imagine me leading our youth, our young adult ministry? Can you imagine me, this is, okay, this is the scariest one. Can you imagine me leading our music ministry? <laughs> Thank God for Brother Bill and his team up here. Can you imagine me being your barista at the coffee house making, making you a macchiato? <laughs> Did I say that right? No. Okay. My wife is like, you don't want him to do that. You don't want him to do that. Hey, we can value others' ministry at Crossroads because we have an awesome staff. We have awesome volunteers. Thank you, Jesus. I value all their ministries because it takes the whole ministry that much more effective when every part of the body is doing what they are called to do. Amen? Amen. It makes us more effective for Jesus in accomplishing his mission. You see, we should show support to others for their ministry, and Paul has given us an example right here in Philemon, with that Philemon as, as he's doing with him. We should be doing for others. When was the last time that you complimented someone else to them about their ministry? Paul could have done the opposite. You see, Paul could have started this letter by tuning his own horn and talking about how great he was and how great his ministry was and all the things God has accomplished through him and his ministry. Paul could have, in verses 4 through 7, Paul could have done it this way. He could have said, he could have wrote, you know, Philemon, the resurrected, ascended Jesus came back and he spoke directly to me. 
You know what else, Philemon? I had been traveling the whole world. I had been leading many people to Jesus. I've been teaching and training leaders, and I had been starting churches all over the place. <laughs> but Paul didn't do that, did he? Paul didn't do that at all. He calls Philemon in this passage his fellow laborer. And he basically said to Philemon, Philemon, I appreciate you. And I appreciate all of you are doing for the Lord Jesus Christ. I appreciate your ministry. And I encourage you, if you're a ministry leader or you're just a volunteer that's serving and serving in some way at our church, I encourage you this week, even today, while it's fresh on your mind, put this principle into action. Take a moment today, this afternoon, send a text message or an email or tell someone in person, someone that's serving in a ministry that you are not a part of, how much you value them and their ministry. That's what Paul did. And it doesn't have to be me, by the way. <laughs> Your notes say this. It says, Paul commends Philemon on three things that should stand out in every Christian's life. Remember, we are all co-laborers together with God. So I want you to see the very first thing, and that is love. Paul commends Philemon concerning his love. In verse number five, his love for Jesus. But then his love for all believers. Look at me once again in verse five. Paul writes these words. He says, wherefore I hear of your love. Drop down to verse number seven. He says, for we have great joy and encouragement on account of your love. Again, and that's, that's the thing about it is, it says this in your notes, it says when you love Jesus first and foremost, you have no problem loving other people. Philemon's love was first towards Jesus, and because of that, it naturally spilled over to him loving other people. Secondly, Paul notices another characteristic in the life of Philemon that should stand out in every Christian's life. And that is faith. Faith. Paul says that he heard of Philemon's love as well as his faith. Look at me once again, if you will, at verse number five. He says, whenever I hear of your love and faith. <laughs> Word gets around, doesn't it? <laughs> and people were talking about Philemon all the way back in Rome where Paul was 2,000 miles away. Hey, when you are a man or you are a woman <coughs> of faith, that characteristic becomes part of your reputation. That becomes part of your testimony. That becomes part of what you are known for. That you are a man or a woman or a boy or a girl or a teenager of faith. And people recognize that, even if they've never met you before. And people are talking about you. They recognize that trait about you because your reputation precedes you. But Paul also heard that Philemon was sharing his faith in verse number six. You see, his faith, Philemon's faith in Jesus, as verse six says, was based on every good thing that was in him that came from who? Came from Christ Jesus. And that was too good for him to keep to himself. He wanted to share his faith. And Paul says that in your notes, your faith is most effective when it's shared with others, testifying of the goodness of God in your life. How he's answered your prayers. How he's been there for you in the bad times as well as the good times. How he's been there for you through thick and thin. How he continues to minister to your heart. How he continues to provide you peace amidst all the chaos in your life. How he brings you that unspeakable joy that you have in your inner person. How he continues to fulfill all your needs. Praise Jesus. 
Paul says, testify of your faith. He says it's effective when you do it, when people see the words of the Bible come alive in your life. You see, you have people, maybe even yourself, that testify about all other kinds of things. We do that. You know, you might buy a product at the store, or maybe you bought something online, and you start using it, and you are so happy with it, and you start telling everybody else about it. You know, or maybe somebody comes over to your house. We have people that come over our house, whether they're our kids or grandkids or friends, and they'll come over. They'll spend the night. They'll spend a few days with us. You know, recently we had someone come over, and they ended up taking a shower. After they took a shower, they came out of the shower, and they started complimenting us on our shower head. <laughs> of all things, they're like, "That shower head! That shower head is awesome! Where did you get that shower head?" And I'm like, "That's pretty awesome, isn't it?" Yeah, we got it for like 30 bucks on Amazon. But, uh, yeah, it's amazing. We got, we, got, we got it for such a great deal. But, you know, we started talking about the shower head and how great it was. And we were testifying about the shower head. <laughs> hey, maybe you testify to others about how great your lawn guy is or how great your pool guy is or your hairstylist or your manicurists, or how wonderful the french fries are at McDonald's, or the ice cream, or, cu or uh, custard at Rares or Culver's is, which they're fantastic, by the way. You, you, see, you see, we testify about all kinds of things to others to spread the good news, but folks, you have the greatest news. You have the greatest story ever told, and you are part of that story. Testify of the goodness, of the greatness of our wonderful, marvelous Savior, Jesus Christ. As a Christian, we know that we have been made complete in Christ. And you're, when your faith begins to rest in who you are in Jesus, and you begin to allow him to live in and through you, you will testify and you will magnify the Lord Jesus in your day-to-day -day interactions with other people. You will become a modern-day Philemon because you cannot help but share the goodness of God in your life to others, just like we just sang about. You can't help but thank God, just like we sang about before this message today. Love. Faith, and one final characteristic that Paul says about Philemon that should stand out in every Christian's life, ministry, ministry. He concludes in verse number seven, if you can look at it with me please again, at the end of verse seven he writes, the hearts of the saints are refreshed through you, Philemon. Philemon, in other words, was a blessing to others. He was a blessing in many ways. One of the ways we know he was a blessing was by having a church made in his house. Now, it's important for us to know this. Back then in that day, it's not like it is today. Today, we have the ability to buy, rent, build buildings where we can have church. And we're blessed to be able to have everything that we have here at Crossroads. But that wasn't the case back then in the Roman Empire. If a group of people consisted of a church and they wanted to meet someplace, they had to meet in somebody's house. And people still do that today in some places. They do that today. Somebody, in other words, would have to be willing to open up the doors of their house for ministry. And Philemon did just that. The church members probably were like this. We need a place to meet. And finally, they probably said, we can meet at my house. He opened his home. And what that tells us about Philemon was this, that this man was filled with the gracious, giving spirit of Christ. Philemon's attitude was this. Whatever I have, even my own home, I want to use it for the work of God and be a blessing to others. And when we have that attitude, you know, it's like this for us today. It might be, I'll open up my home for a small group Bible study or one-on-one -on -one discipleship. 
I'll open up my home for a class get-together. I'll open up my home and invite others over for a meal. I'll open up my home, and I know that there's widows and widowers in our church that don't have any family. I know there's college students in our church. Their family is far off. I'll open up my home and invite them to come over for Thanksgiving. I'll open up my home and invite this young family and their kids to come and play in our big backyard and swim in our pool. I'll invite people over to come over for a time of prayer for our upcoming election. I'll open up my home and that was Philemon's attitude. It doesn't matter how big your house is. It doesn't matter how small. It doesn't matter how extravagant. It doesn't matter how messy. <laughs> the bottom line is this, is in your notes. Are you being a blessing to others with what God has blessed you with? That's ministry. That's ministry. Believers who are Philemon's, man, they think beyond providing for themselves, but they think about how they can be a blessing to other people. And I know we have a lot of Philemon's in our church. Thank you, Jesus, for that. As I was preparing this message, I was thinking about so many different people in our church that are Philemon's that willingly give of themselves in ministry. I was thinking of one person in particular in our church they were in the 9 o'clock service. As I was writing this message, I was thinking about how this person opens up their home regularly and lets various people stay there, live there, that can't afford to pay rent anywhere else, and they need a place to stay for a while. When you do these things, there's going to be a cost involved, maybe financially, definitely a cost of your time and, and your effort. There's going to be setup time. There's going to be cleanup time. There's going to be time to do things in between. But nothing, nothing compares to the cost, the price that was paid for you by Jesus for you to be in the position that you are in today. One tangible way that you can do this, like we talked about earlier when Cody was up here, is yes, by using up your home, but also serving in a ministry like Walk Through Bethlehem. We've talked about love, faith, and ministry today. And when you serve in Walk Through Bethlehem, you see all those accomplished. You see, when you serve in Walk Through Bethlehem, you have a part in sharing the love of Christ with others, regardless of what box you check off on the handout this morning. You have a part in sharing the love of Christ. You have the part of being involved in ministry. And then lastly, you have a part in seeing the hundreds of people who will pray in those five nights to receive Jesus Christ as their Savior by faith and faith alone. Amen? Amen. You have a part in that. Love, faith, ministry. Those are the three things Paul saw and he heard about in Onesimus' life. And because of that, other believers were refreshed by him and his family. Isn't it nice to be and serve along somebody that refreshes you and encourages you? People could come over by Lehman's house and they wouldn't have to worry about cooking. That was refreshing. People could come over and they, they wouldn't have to, uh, uh, they, they could come over and they could just relax, or they could play, or they can pray. <laughs> that was refreshing. People could, people could leave and not have to worry about cleaning up, doing the dishes, sweeping the floors, cleaning up spills and messes from little children, or older adults. <laughs> that was really refreshing. Your handout says this. It says there's a cost in being hospitable, but reward far outweighs the cost by the blessings that are given as well as received. Amen? Amen. We are all commanded as believers to be hospitable. Romans 12, 13 says we should be given to hospitality. Titus 1, 8 tells us to be lovers of hospitality. And let's bring up 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 9. I love this verse. It says, show hospitality to one another without complaining. complaining. 
What incredible lessons that we learn here just in the first seven verses of this book of the Bible. The work of the ministry is a team effort, and it's so important for us to recognize we're co-laborers together with God. Don't forget, put some of this into practice today. Send that text message, email, tell someone in person today that serves in a ministry other than the one you serve in, how much you appreciate them and their ministry. Amen. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes as we prepare for prayer this morning. And maybe you are here today. And as I mentioned earlier, this story about Philemon is about Onesimus. He was running away as far as he could from his master. And maybe that's you. Maybe you've been trying to run as far away as you can from God. Paul's message for Onesimus was for him to go home, for him to be reconciled and reunited back with his master. Can I tell you this this morning? If you're not in the place where you should be in your relationship with God, you can run. But just remember, as we sang earlier, his goodness is going to continue to run after you until it catches you. God loves you. And God desires a relationship with you, no matter where you are in life today. Again, he desires for you to be reconciled back to him and for him to be your master, your savior, and your Lord. If you've been running away, so to speak, it's time for you to return home. Return to Him and surrender all to Jesus. Surrender yourself to Him. Over the last two Sundays, we have four people, four adults that have prayed, that have come and prayed to receive Jesus as their Savior. So if that's you, it's nothing uncommon to let go of the reins and give them over to Jesus. Let Him have control of your life. If you're here this morning and you say, Pastor Rich, I'm saved. But I'm not fully surrendered. I need to be more of a Philemon in the area of loving others like I love Jesus. I need to be more faithful. I need to do more ministry. I encourage you, if that's you this morning, I pray that your prayer will also be, I surrender all. I surrender all to Jesus. All that I have all that I am and all that I have is because of him and his goodness to me. Lord Jesus, thank you for your goodness to us each and every day. The supreme goodness that you showed to us by dying on the cross so we can be forgiven of our sins. Be able to live the Christ life today and have the, our home in heaven waiting for us in the future. God, you are so good to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you need to come see us after the service and talk to us about your salvation, we would be happy to be your Paul. And you be our Isthmus and share the good news of Jesus with you. We're always available up front and also in our reception room in the back. So let's stand and let's sing this final song together, songs together, and let's surrender all to Jesus. Amen? Amen.